Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension Cooperative Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight it's my pleasure to introduce to you Ken Bradbury. He's the director of the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey. He was born in Richmond, Indiana. He went to and uh, went to high school there. Went to Ohio Wesleyan in Delaware, Ohio for a degree in geology. Then he went to Indiana University and got a master's degree in geology. And he came here to UW-Madison to get a PhD in hydrogeology. And since 1982, he's been with the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey. And he's been director since 2015. Tonight he's going to talk to us about Wisconsin's geoheritage. This is in uh, concurrence with this week, which is Earth Science Week all over the world. And uh, I think it's a great thing to think about not only what geology has done for Wisconsin, but also geologists, including folks like Increase Lapham, Thomas Chamberlain, who was a geologist and the first uh, scientist who was president of this university, and of course Charles Van Hise, who was a geologist and who's, uh, from, my, from my point of view, gave the best idea of what the Wisconsin idea is when he said, I shall never be content until the beneficent influence of the university reaches every family of the state. Rocks are good, geologists are even better. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Ken Bradbury back to Winston Night Lab. Well, thank you, Tom, and thanks, thanks for inviting me to speak to you. It's a, it's a real a real treat and honor to, to be invited to speak to Wednesday Night at the Lab. So tonight I wanted to, to uh, give you a kind of a quick tour around Wisconsin's <laughs> geology and talk about our Wisconsin's geoheritage, how Wisconsin's geology has shaped our past, our present, and, and our future. Um, and as Tom said, it is Earth Science Week, um, all week, and every day is a special day. Today is Fossil Day. And I'm not sure that's why I was invited. <laughs> uh, you could hold that pose a little bit. But, I, but, but I, I can tell you a little story, a personal story. As Tom said, I grew up in Richmond, Indiana, and I grew up on a farm. And on our farm, we had a, a <coughs> creek. And that creek had really nice ortovician fossils of corals and, and brachiopods and, and uh, uh, plesopods, which are little shell, shell-shaped creatures. And they were very easy to find, and they were very good fossils. And I used to collect them for Boy Scout projects and 4-H projects and things like that. And, and they were so easy to find that I thought paleontology was pretty easy stuff. And it, it actually wasn't until I went to college, and I took paleontology in college, that the professor brought out these beat up, crummy, decomposed fossils to show us. And I said, well, what are these? And he said, well, this is our best fossil collection at Ohio Wesleyan University, and I said, well, I've got better fossils than this in, our, in my backyard. <laughs> and, and, and he said, well, where do you live? And I told him I lived on Elkhorn Creek in, in Wayne County, Indiana. He said, well, that's like the best Ordovician fossils in the whole North America. And I didn't even know it. I was, so that's how I grew up. I'm not a paleontologist, though, but I, I, I'm, I'm a hydrogeologist. Now, in my talk tonight, I'm going to have a lot of, of photos and a lot of diagrams. and. Most of them are from this book called Roadside Geology of Wisconsin by Bob Dodd and John Addick, who are two retired geologists that are still active in the area. It's an excellent book. We sell it at the State Geological Survey, uh, or you can buy it on Amazon or probably buy it at the UW Bookstore. But if you're interested in, in, in knowing about geology that you can actually see driving around the state, this is a really great resource. So I'm going to talk about geoheritage. What is geoheritage? And, and, and to me, this, we're, we're talking here about geological sites that have significant cultural, educational, scientific, or aesthetic value, um, and which is many places in Wisconsin. So here's a great shot of, of the Wisconsin River from Ferry Bluff taken by, by one of our colleagues, Eric Carson, who's a geologist at, at the survey. Heritage, geoheritage has many values for us, um, aesthetic, art, economic. <coughs> Uh, so here's a woolly mammoth. This is at, at the Horicon Marsh Visitor Center, and it shows you the conjunction of geology 
in history and art, where they've they've created a woolly mammoth out of uh, uh, iron and iron and steel and rebar and so forth, which I thought was kind of a neat thing. Uh, we have a wonderful geologic landscape in Wisconsin. That's a great place to be a geologist. Uh, our landscape, of course, is part of our, our history and our cultural identity. Uh, these are Morgan Falls up, up by something called St. Peter's Dome that's up, up, uh, up in the North Woods, a uh, neat place to visit. Uh, how do we pr preserve this geoheritage? Well, we, have, uh, we do it in many ways. We have state, county, and local parks. We have state natural areas. Do you know we have over 600 state natural areas? And the first few of them were all based on geology. Most of them now are based on, on biological uh, features of some sort. And they're all over the state, and they're, they're probably a little bit underused. I'm, I'm throwing a pitch off for that because I'm on the uh, Natural Heritage uh, Council. Uh, so we have these natural areas. We have historic sites and markers. We have museums and collections, some very fine geology museum here on campus. There's the Weiss Museum at, uh, over there by Oshkosh, uh, many other geology museum at uh, Milwaukee and so forth. And we have many cultural and custom, uh, our culture and customs are, are linked to geology in many ways. So let's start a little tour around the state. And when I wanted to put this talk together, I was trying to figure out how to organize it. You know, and most geologists think in linear terms of, of the past to the present or different rock types. And I was having trouble with that. So this is going to be a little more of a hopscotch around the state looking at different things. But there is some organization there. So let's start up here on the, the dells of the St. Croix River where, where the, the, we're looking at, at ancient basalt lava flows are making up the, these banks. These, are, these, are, uh, the, the, these uh, banks are basalt lava flows of, of, of about a billion years old. Uh, and when we think about that, it's, we think we have to change this into a mosaic. What's the geoheritage? It's a mosaic of many things, exploration, science, mining, building, water resources, agriculture, industry, recreation, and tourism. And I don't have time tonight, or I wouldn't have time in a week, to talk about all of these things. So I'm just going to hit a few of the high points. But to start with, it's important to, that we think about time, geologic time, and, and realize that geologic time goes back a long way. So this is the, the generally accepted worldwide geologic time scale that goes back to about four and a half billion years the age of the Earth, more or less. So these are 4,400 million years. So that's a lot of years. That's the entire giant time scale. This is what Wisconsin has. We have the same time, of course, but we don't have all the record of that. We, we are missing quite a bit. So we have our geologic rocks, or what we call the geologic section, includes Precambrian rocks that are up to 3 billion years old. We have Paleozoic rocks that are between 400,000 and or 400 million and five or 600 million years old, and then we're missing a bunch of time, a bunch of rocks up till we get to the Quaternary, which is in the last uh, 100,000 years. Um, so, so we're missing very big blocks of time. Why are we missing them? Either either rocks weren't deposited here in Wisconsin during those times, or more likely they were eroded away. In any case, we don't have records of those times. But we do have, uh, it, it, the fascinating thing is we have some of the oldest rocks in the world here, and we have some of the youngest features too, and we have something in between. So it's quite a, quite a neat place to be a geologist. So where are these rocks? Well, these, the, uh, if we go up to northern Wisconsin, these Precambrian rocks, which are, which are here and up, up here along Lake Superior, I'm saying they're really, really old. These are billions of years old. Okay. Uh, one to three billion years. And then we go to the Cambrian rocks, which are mostly sandstones and some dolomites and limestones that are south central Wisconsin. And those are only, I'm going to say, only really old, only 500 million years or so. We can go a little younger to the old rocks, the Ordovician rocks, which are 300 or 400 million years ago. And then the, um, what I'm calling our youngest bedrock, which are the uh, Silurian and Devonian rocks over along Lake Michigan here, which are young, youngest if you call 400 million years young. So those are that's kind. Of, this is our geologic bedrock, our bedrock section. And I'll talk about the glacial materials in a little while, just to give you a sense of where those where those are. Now I'm I'm very 
pleased to be the director of the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey because it's Wisconsin geologists, many of whom work for our survey, that, that discovered or recorded or mapped these rocks. And so what do we do? We, we are part of the University of Wisconsin Extension. Um, we do research, inventory, teaching, uh, and science about the rocks, minerals, and waters of Wisconsin. The original survey was a real survey. In other words, a project to survey the rocks and minerals of the state that happened beginning in 1853. Uh, and then our organization kind of came and went, and it, our current organization dates to 1897. But we had, as you can see in these photos, uh, uh, many, many uh, of the famous geologists, some of whom Tom mentioned, were part of the survey from time to time. And the exciting thing about being part of the survey is that we have a huge legacy of exploration and science that we, we hold for Wisconsin. Uh, we have samples, we have uh, mineral samples, rock samples, we have many, many maps and records. And these are the kinds of things we have. Back in um, uh, 1882, the uh, was the first publication of this big tome, Geology of Wisconsin, and Tom mentioned Thomas uh, Chamberlain, who was a famous geologist. Uh, he was the editor of this big volume, which had many authors. He also became one of the first presidents of the University of Wisconsin. But it, here, here he is the, from the, the front part of this. He's talking about uh, having the honor of submitting volume one of the final report of the Geological Survey of Wisconsin of course, it wasn't really the final report because here we still are over 100 years later. Uh, but it was, a, it was a, a really interesting time and these guys were, were, you know, they were real adventurers. And I wanted to just read a little bit um, uh, so, so, so out, of that, out of that book uh, talking about what they went through in mapping the Flambeau River, which is, which is up in northern Wisconsin. And part, one of the things that happened during that mapping is one of the geologists, a guy named Moses Strong, was killed in a, in a drowned in the Flambeau River during this work. Um, but some of the things they talked about in their report, they say, the large amount of wholly uninhabited territory had to be traversed, unfavorable weather, low water in the streams, <coughs> made it necessary to drag or carry the canoes over considerable distances. The inaccuracy or incompleteness of the government survey throughout much of the region all conspired to make anything like complete work impossible. On the night of November 5th, the river closed with ice. This necessitated the abandoning of the canoe, packing of specimens, provisions, and camp equipage, rendering it desirable to avoid all travel, not absolutely necessary to the work before us. So these guys were, you know, they were adventurers, and they, they, were, they were brave people trying to do this, this work, and their work has held up over the years. Tom mentioned Charles Van Heys, another very famous person uh, who graduated, by the way, from Beloit College uh, and became a very, very well-known geologist. One of the neat things we have at the survey are cop or his original notebooks from his field work. And, and we, have, we have records of all those. Of course, he is, besides being UW president in 1903, he's really considered the main author of the Wisconsin idea, which has gotten some, some press recently. So, <laughs> so we are, uh, we're, we're pleased to call him one of our, one of our own. Uh, but these field books are fascinating because you can go back to those field books which we have in, in, in our archives and see his original notes and explorations and drawings about how he and others explored Wisconsin. And then we have actually the actual rock samples in our sample repository that he collected. Now, one of the, the famous things about Van Heys is he's got a rock named after him, and, and so our tour of Wisconsin is going to start near Baraboo at Van Heys Rock, which is near the town of Rock Springs that's uh, about seven or eight miles west of Baraboo in Sauk County. And so when you go to Van Heys Rock, there's this historical marker talking about the Baraboo Quartzite, which is what the rock is composed of, and the Baraboo Hills, and it, but it talks about Van Heist, the renowned geologist, conservationist, and president of the University of Wisconsin. And he's very famous for the work that's kind of embodied in this rock. Now it's kind of a strange looking, not the most attractive rock you ever saw, probably, but it's, it's geologically fascinating because it's, it's showing a, uh, what you can see here, these, these are beds of quartzite that originally formed in a horizontal way 
but then they've been uplifted and turned vertically by tectonic <coughs> forces uh, over geologic history. And then there's also some other th structural things going on, like the folding of these beds next to the, the, the black rock next to the, the lighter colored rock there. This particular, these, the particular um, structural geology principles that, are, that Van Heist saw in this and demonstrated have been looked at around the world. In fact, this rock has been in, pictured in geology books all over the world. When I was, Tom mentioned I went to Indiana University for my master's degree, and students from Indiana University and other Midwestern colleges frequently come up to the Baraboo area to look at the Van Heist rock and other uh, features because this is the most southern place in Central North America where you can see Precambrian rocks and see these structural relationships. So these are, this is a famous place for geology students. And so this is, this is the kind of thing that you can, you can see there. Uh, so this, this is uh, the Baraboo area, Devil's Lake is there, the town of Baraboo is here. And, but beneath the surface there's been a big syncline that's been formed by tectonic forces over the years that have taken this quartzite, which is several billion years old, and bent it, bent it downward and tipped the edges up. And then other rocks have been deposited in between uh, or, or on top of that. Uh, so there's quartzite and then there's some volcanic rhyolite as well. And if you're at Van Heis Rock, you can see these things. And if you, at, if you happen to go to Van Heis Rock and then turned around, you would see a gorge called Abelman's Gorge. And this is a cartoon um, that shows the, all the complicated geology that you can see at Abelman's Gorge. And what you can see there are these vertical uh, beds of quartzite that are overlaying and buried under uh, Cambrian sandstone. And the interesting thing here is this quartzite is about a billion years old, or maybe two billion. The Cambrian sandstone is five or six hundred million years old. So there's 500 million years of lost time in there. That's what geologists call an unconformity. Now, so you can turn around from Van Heis Rock, look at the other side of the street, and you're at Abelman's Gorge, which is another state natural area. And you can see these vertical cliffs of quartzite. And I happened to go there last week, and wouldn't you know, here's a woman playing a piano in the middle of <laughs> Abelman's Gorge. Uh, <laughs> and I stopped to ask what was going on, and there was some sort of uh, of, of um, a local local event where they have little little art art things going on in various attractive places, and there happened to be a piano there. It was just left for anyone to play. I thought it was kind of a neat thing. But that's a that's a wonderful place to go. There's a really nice trail to see the gorge. So if you go to the gorge, you'll see these vertical beds, and you can see how vertical they are. And do we know that they started out horizontally? Well, we do because if you look closely at the bottom, you can see these cross beds. And cross beds are, are, are these features where you can see that this material was originally deposited in a, by water or wind currents on a beach or a shallow sea, because we see things like this in modern sediments all the time, and then they've been upturned. The other thing you can see are ripple marks. They're vertically ripple marks. Now these didn't form vertically, they formed again in a flat sea, and now they've been uh, turned upward. And again, these are about a billion years of Old, so we know something about the Earth's environment then, that it wasn't, parts of it were not much different than now. We had beaches and ripples and waves and currents happening back then. The other thing you see at Abelman's Gorge is you can see this contrast in color. So if you look at the bluff there, you can see these rocks and then these sort of redder rocks. And I'm going to draw a line there. And that's the, that's the unconformity between the Precambrian quartzite here and the Cambrian Age sandstones that were deposited later above them. So, for, so this is from the really, really old, just the really old rocks. So along that line, there's a, you know, 500 million years of time missing, which is pretty interesting for geologists. So that's Abelman's Gorge. And as long as you're up in the Dells, you really ought to go see Parfrey's Glen. And so Parfrey's, and, and this map shows all the little red triangles on here are interesting geological places that are all, every one of them is worth a visit. So, uh, but let's, let's go over to, meander over to Parfrey's Glen. This happens to be state natural area number one. Uh, it, it's, it's the very first state natural area. And Parfrey's Glen, if you haven't been there, and I'm sure many of you have, is a, is a, a canyon cut through this, um, cut through the Cambrian sandstone. 
the Cambrian sandstone there is really interesting because it's full of quartzite boulders. And the quartzite boulders are made of that Baraboo quartzite that, that came off those, those quartzite cliffs not very far away. And so what you get here at Parfrey's Glen is a kind of a vision of an ancient environment where you had probably waves, sea waves crashing onto the quartzite cliffs along a sea, breaking off boulders, breaking off chunks of rock that got incorporated into the sand and gravel that was, at the, that was along the beach. And then as streams formed, these got incorporated into the streams and deposited like this. So it looks like a modern deposit, but it's, this is ancient. This is an ancient stream. Those, these, these rocks are, you know, they're submitted in there forever. They've been there for millions and millions, hundreds of millions of years. A fascinating place to, to see, a, see the, the contrast of ancient environments. And then, of course, if you're in that area, who wouldn't go to Devil's Lake? Uh, so here we are at Devil's Lake State Park, and, and, and this has a lot of cultural significance as well as geological significance because it, for we know now that it's, it's the most popular state park in the state, but historically it was always popular. In fact, there used to be several hotels on the banks of Devil's Lake. The railroad there used to run from Chicago, and people would ride up from Chicago to spend their vacation at Devil's Lake. There were steamboats on the lake and so forth, and I'm told that Ab on this particular boat that Abraham Lincoln's wife and Ulysses Grant took a ride one time. So there, there's a great history of, of culture at Devil's Lake State Park, but there's fantastic geology too. So if we look at these, at these, quartzite, uh, these quartzite cliffs that form the nice talus slope and the, and the bluffs there, though that's the same rock that we just saw over at, over at uh, Parfrey's Glen and at, and at Abelman's Gorge. And if we climb up there to a place called Elephant Rock, which is along the what's called the East Bluff Trail, we can see these relationships again, where we have the Precambrian quartzite at the bottom, we have Cambrian sandstone at the top, and in between you can see quartzite boulders that have been incorporated into that sandstone. So then this is just a wonderful place to understand the cycles of erosion and deposition that happen in geology. And as long as you're up there, of course, turn around and take me to the view because uh, it's a wonderful place. And this was how it looked last Friday. These trees are probably a little bit better now. So those are the really, really old rocks. And now let's let's talk a little more, a little bit about the Cambrian rocks. And and and, and these are these are also really old, but they're they're 500 million years younger than those those Precambrian rocks. So this is. And most of these rocks are sandstone. And so sandstone is just a rock that's made up of the kind of sand you might find on a beach. Um, these, there's an outcrop of typical Cambrian sandstone. And you can see the cross bedding there. So we know that this was deposited in some sort of fluvial or wind-blown environment. And up the upper right there, you see a microscope photo of the sand grains. This is from a sample right here under us in Madison. And you can see how those grains are rounded, they're sorted, which means they're all about the same diameter, uh, and they're almost entirely quartz. They look like little pieces of glass, uh, and and that's really a that shows you a very it's a very mature sandstone, meaning meaning it's been sorted and blown around for a long time before it, it was deposited. That sandstone, that Cambridge sandstone, covers much of the bedrock. It is part of the bedrock in much of southern Wisconsin. Here's a great bluff of Waniwak the Waniwak Formation in near La Crosse, off, off of Highway 14, if you're driving into La Crosse. Um, these were formed in a shallow, probably beach or dune environment. So here you can see, uh, uh, you know, kind of as, as the shorelines uh, came and went, the sand was deposited along the shore. It was probably rearranged by some sand dunes. Uh, there could have been some submarine cross bedding. There are some marine shells and burrows in some of this, some of this sand. It's a very wide, widespread formation. In fact, Wisconsin is really a pretty sandy place. And there's fantastic places if you go down to uh, southwest Wisconsin in the Driftless area. You can see great south crops like this is at the town of Rockbridge in a little town park. The cool thing here is there's a tunnel right through the bluff. So you can walk from one side to the other uh, through, right through the sandstone here and come out the other side. Kind of a neat place to go. Um, there are these, these towers of 
uh, sandstone that you've seen if you've driven through central Wisconsin. This is called Rabbit Rock, near Adam's Friendship, but, but there are Scrooge Cree and there's Friendship Mound. There's many of these, these sandstone outliers. And these were, these were places where the sandstone was just a little more resistant to erosion. And so as, as the sandstone, which completely covered the area, eroded away, these, were, these towers were left. And actually, I'll talk about Lake Wisconsin in a few minutes. These stood up as, as islands in Lake Wisconsin, Glacial Lake Wisconsin. <coughs> now, when we start talking about sand, we can't avoid the topic of frac sand mining, which has been a, a very uh, uh, important new industry for Wisconsin. It's, it's a bit controversial, certainly. But it's, we have it because we have such a large area of, of sandstone, and all these little red boxes are places where there are frac sand mines. Now, to be clear, we don't do any fracking in Wisconsin. Sometimes there's a misnomer that we do that. We don't do that. Fracking is done in other places, but the sand that they use is, is, is mined here and is shipped out of the state to mostly western states where they do, where they do, uh, they do the fracking. And it takes a lot of sand. It takes you know, train loads of sand for a single well. It's amazing how much sand is, is used. And Wisconsin has the best sand because we have this quartz sand that's got the right hardness, the right diameter, the right sorting, and so forth. So it's an important industry. Um, but that lets me transition to talking about mining in Wisconsin. This is a modern mining industry, but Wisconsin has a great history of mining. In fact, if you look at our state flag or our state seal, there's a miner on there. That miner was probably a lead miner because our first mining was really lead mining. And this is, this is a vein of glena, which is an ore of lead that, that you can see now down near Platteville. And um, early lead mining was an important cultural uh, feature of Wisconsin. The, the, the Native Americans, of course, found some of these lead ores at the surface and they found they could make, they were pretty malleable, they could melt them easily and they could make trinkets or even utensils or tools out of them. Later on, the first settlers started, uh, started mining and, and they, they dug shallow mines that were called badger holes, and that's one of the reasons we're called the Badger State, because of the shallow mines were called badger holes. Uh, and if you go down to southwest Wisconsin now, you can still see some of these diggings. And of course, as mining became more sophisticated, they just started to go underground like this, and they mined not only lead, but zinc as well. And, and it was, there was quite a mining industry in southwest Wisconsin for lead and zinc. Um, and that, that had a lot of cultural <coughs> significance too because the tin miners from Cornwall, England migrated and settled in southwest Wisconsin to work on the lead deposits because they, they, they had a mining culture. And now you can go to Mineral Point and there's Shake Rag Alley and there is a lot of mining culture and, and uh, gift shops too left over from, from that time. Um, during the, you know, in the, in the late 1800s er, and early to mid 1900s, uh, the, the mining was done on a pretty big industrial scale. Uh, these are, this is the Calumet and Hecla mine in Schulzburg, uh, underground mining. It's interesting to note that most of the bullets from the Civil War, I'm told, came from lead mined in southwest Wisconsin. Uh, so this, this was a big industry, but it, it wasn't our only mining industry because we also have done a lot of iron mining. And so we had a number of, of mining districts around the state. The, the Southwest lead, lead District was down here, but the iron mining or the ferrous mining occurred around Baraboo, occurred over at Mayville, Black River Falls, and then a lot up in the Guigibic range up, up in northern Wisconsin. And what they were mining for most of those mines was taconite ore, which is, which, which is a iron ore that's, that's very heavy, very old, uh, again, Precambrian rocks. Um, there's an interesting history there, too. The, I don't know how many of you remember the Jackson County Iron Mine, which, which uh, was up near Black River Falls. It was an open pit mine that closed in the, in the mid-1970s. It was a, a very big mine uh, that was over 300 feet deep. Um, and uh, it closed not because they ran out of ore, but because of economics it didn't work out anymore. Uh, that was reclaimed, and now it's a county park called Lake Wazee County Park. It's one of the deepest lakes in Wisconsin, again being over 300 feet deep, and it's a mecca for scuba divers because the water is so nice, nice and clear. Another interesting note, this is in a very flat area of Wisconsin, and now there are hills around. The hills are the old mine spoil that they, they left there and, and revegetated. So uh, it's an interesting place to visit if you're up around Black River Falls. 
our probably most famous mining is from the from the north, from the Gogebic Range, from the the Hurley and then Ironwood uh, Bessemer area, uh, just just on the Michigan border, uh, where iron ore was discovered. And these were mostly underground, deep underground shaft mines. And in fact, at the time. Uh, in the early part of this century, or the last century, they were some of the deepest mines in the world. These, these went down a couple of thousand feet. Uh, the air was hot down there. The water was warm that came in. Um, I'm told they had, you know, they had horses and mules that they used for pulling the mine carts around that lived underground. It was a, a huge operation. So now if you go to Hurley, you can see things like this is a, this is a, 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 a core sample from the Hurley mine shaft that's about five feet diameter uh, and it came, came from a couple of thousand feet below the surface. And this was a big deal. You could look at the, here's an article from the 1886 Chicago Tribune. I know you can't see all this, but it says, Wisconsin's Bonanza, newly discovered iron region near Hurley. The wilderness of a year ago has vanished and in its place there were flourishing cities and theaters, banks, saloons, and electric lights. Um, and it will bring its owners uh, money and some frauds. So they were, there was a bit of controversy about mining even back then. Um, another kind of mining that Wisconsin has, is, has flourished in Wisconsin is, is uh, our uh, dimension stone, dolomite and limestone quarries. These are mostly in eastern Wisconsin. And here's a couple of old historic photos of, of miners at, at, at these old uh, dolomite quarries. Some of that dolomite was used to make cement by burning it in kilns. And, and uh, so there are, there are a few historic lime kilns around where they would, they would take the, the <coughs> dolomite or limestone, grind it up, and burn it. And that changes it into a material they can make cement out of. So here's, here's a park at Grafton, Wisconsin, where these old lime kilns are. And you can go up to Door County or, or up, up, up the Door Peninsula and find old, other old historic, historic kilns. But, but this gives me a chance to transition to talk about Eastern Wisconsin and the, and the Niagara Escarpment. And again, so here's a map of Eastern Wisconsin. Again, we see many little red triangles, each of which is an interesting geological spot. Again, worth, worth a visit. Uh, so the Niagara Escarpment is this, is this um, uh, a, a dolomite formation of Silurian age called the Niagara, we call it generally the Niagara Dolomite or the Niagara Escarpment that, that goes up to the Door Peninsula and forms that peninsula and actually reaches uh, wraps around the Michigan Basin to, to form Niagara Falls. If you've ever been to Niagara Falls, you're looking at the same rocks that you are in, in the Door Peninsula. Um, and the way why that forms is that we, you can see on the, on the right of this slide, the eastern part of the state, the rocks are dipping down toward Lake Michigan. Uh, the Niagara Formation, these Silurian rocks are a little bit more resistant, and so when they erode, they form this escarpment on the western side, and then there's a, this is called the dip slope that goes to the east. And the, what we get from that are these high cliffs that you see in Door County. This is, this is near Fish Creek, um, off of Peninsula State Park, and uh, actually near Ephraim in Door County. You see these high cliffs of Silurian age dolomite. And if you go to the other side of the county, the Lake Michigan side, you see lower cliffs. This is Cave Point. County Park in Door County, both fantastic places to visit, by the way. But this is why the cliffs on the on the eastern side are lower because the, the dip of the rocks is from west to east. Um, and where do these rocks come from? Well, these rocks, these are dolomites and limestones that are made up of the tiny bodies of millions and billions of little sea creatures that flourished in a shallow tropical sea. And it was much of it was a reef environment, like we might find in the Bahamas or uh, off of Florida today. And so when we look at those rocks, we often find fossils. So the, the Silurian Sea may have looked something like this, a shallow, warm, kind of tropical sea with all these, all these different uh, uh, creatures that lived back in Silurian time, 400 million years ago. We know those are there because today we can find fossils. Uh, we find these, these, are, these are brachiopods. These are the same kind of things I used to find when I was a kid in Indiana. Um, <coughs> although we didn't find any trilobites there, and the mine were better sometimes, but uh, we find brachiopods, these are, these are corals, uh, this is a trilobite, this is our state fossil, by the way, and these are stromatoporoids, a very, they're a very primitive, uh, uh, primitive kind of uh, animal. These can be found, uh, found in, these, in these rocks. I mentioned quarrying, so now if you go to Potawatomi State Park, which is 
just south of Sturgeon Bay and climb up on the lookout tower and look across the bay, you can see this big quarry, and it's actually called the Big Quarry. This was a historic quarry that's now a county park where they quarried these big blocks of dolomite and they would load them onto ships that would come into the harbor here. And those would be shipped down to Chicago, shipped to the cities in the south, shipped all over the Great Lakes because this rock was such a good building stone. And it was used, and it was crushed, could be crushed and used for roads and many things. So this was a, this was a huge industry in Door County and other places up along, up and down the coast where transportation was easy because you had shipping. Um, and, and the rock was, was, was plentiful. And, and so now that's been turned into a, into a park. And by the way, they still, they don't, not so much in Door County, but other parts of, and other quarries in eastern Wisconsin are still producing a lot of this dimension stone that's getting shipped uh, all over the United States. I was in a quarry near Chilton uh, a year or two ago, and they were taking big blocks. They were getting shipped to Houston, Texas, of all things, to be used as breakwaters. Uh, so, you know, pretty expensive things, things to do. As long as you're in Potawatomi State Park, you've got to take a look around and enjoy the fall weather. But while you're there, you'll notice the eastern terminus of the Ice Age Scenic Trail. And, and so now I'm going to transition to talk about a little bit about our Ice Age geology. So the Ice Age Scenic Trail is, is, is a hiking trail that, that starts up here in, in Potawatomi State Park, wraps around the glacial boundary, and ends up at Interstate Park, which was my first slide. So, this is the glacial boundary of Wisconsin, and many of you have probably seen a diagram like this that shows you what the Laurentide ice sheet did between 100,000 and about uh, 10,000 years ago. One of the things it did is it dammed up Glacial Lake, Wisconsin, and it didn't get down to the driftless area down here, which is why we had a different topography down there. But when you see pictures like this, and this is what you often see in textbooks, you kind of get the idea that that's what it looked like, and the ice was either here or it wasn't here. And, you know, it was either here or it was gone, and, and you don't really get the dynamics of the system. So our survey has recently done something to help educate people better about what actually happened. And so this is a, um, a little video that was made uh, by our state geological survey. The authors are Dave Michelson and John Adig, again, two retired geologists that are still active. And so what they've done here is put together a series of, of maps in a kind of a time, uh, time sequence. And so what you're going to see here is, and it takes about a minute or less to run through this, uh, is, is on, the, on the left a map of Wisconsin with ice coming and going. And on the right here, you're going to see how many years ago it was. And it goes kind of quickly, and I might even show it twice. But as you watch it, keep in mind where the ice was. And look at these lakes that are dammed up in front of the ice. And here's, here's Lake Michigan down here and Lake Superior and just see how that happens. So let's just, let's just watch this and, and get a sense of the dynamics of the, of the Pleistocene, the quaternary here. And you can see how it wasn't all one thing. And it didn't happen all at once. It happened in a number of pulses over different times, um, and over, over tens of thousands of years. And I, I think this gives you a sense that, that the ice was not stagnant. It was moving around. It was retreating during warm periods and almost going away and then coming back. And the time, some things, sometimes things happen fast, sometimes rather slowly. <coughs> what I'm going to do, I'm going to show part of that again, just, just to give you a, a <coughs> uh, and I'm going to stop, or I'm going to point out a couple of things in case you missed it. Uh, um, because one of the things, I think it's interesting to look at these glacial lakes and, and you know that the land uh, in central Wisconsin, we have a big sand plain, and that is Glacial Lake, Wisconsin, which was dammed when the ice hit the edge of the Baraboo Hills right there. Now we have a lake, and suddenly it's going to drain. And when that lake drains, what happened? It, it, it drains when this ice leaves it right there, and what happened then? It carved the Wisconsin Dells. So that's where the Wisconsin Dells formed from the drainage of that lake and the erosion of all that water going down the Wisconsin River at that time. And then there was another lake that formed east of there that was uh, Glacial Lake Oshkosh. And that's why when you, you go over toward Oshkosh or Outagamie County, you have a lot of low, flat-lying, clayey material there. How do we know about the glaciers? Well, we see features like this. These are glacial scratches on some of that soft dolomite. And so we geologists can look at these and tell which direction the ice came from. Uh, 
And that gives me a chance to talk about some of the great glacial features we have here over in the Kettle Moraine, over near West Bend, Washington County, and Waukesha, and parts of Milwaukee County, uh, where we have world-class glacial topography. These are drumlins, uh, sculpted features on the landscape from the ice uh, sheet passing over uh, that, that's rearranged the topography and, and kind of sculpted it. Here's, here it is in the summer. Here's a drumlin field in the winter. And these are world class. People, pictures of Wisconsin drumlins are in, are in textbooks uh, all over the world because this, this is, this is uh, world class. And you can, you can get a sense for this of the dynamics of the ice moving over there. And, and of course, as the ice retreated, it, it left behind deposits. And, and these are, uh, this is a diagram of how the, the kettle, the interlobate kettle moraine uh, formed as a lobe of ice came from Lake Michigan and a lobe came from Green Bay and where they met they left a, a, a plain of collapsed outwash, meaning there was ice in there that melted and left this collapsed topography and left a lot of other features, and that's what we call the Kevel Moraine now. Another great place to visit, and what you see here is, is this <coughs> sinuous hill is an esker. This was a, a river that flowed on top of the glacier. When the glacier melted, all the sand and gravel fell down, collapsed, and formed this, this long, narrow, uh, circuitous hill. I want to switch now and, and talk about water a little bit, uh, because we have a great heritage of water. Wisconsin has abundant, well, we, we, you know, we're a water-rich state, and that had a lot to do with settlement, why people wanted to live here. Availability of water was critical to development and, and you know, settlement, agriculture, and, and industry. And remember that all water, particularly groundwater, which is my expertise, is part of the water cycle, and it all starts as rain or snow on the landscape, much of it runs off and becomes surface water and, and goes into lakes, streams, or wetlands. Some of it recharges and becomes part of the groundwater system. We have great aquifers here. An aquifer is just a, a geologic unit that can transmit or hold or store uh, useful quantities of water. Groundwater flow can go short distances, uh, just from the uh, a, a infiltration to this lake, or it can go very long distances uh, and discharge into a river like the Wisconsin River or, or Lake Michigan. And groundwater sustains our lakes, springs, and wetlands. This is the Mingo <coughs> River estuary up at the tip of Door County, another great place to visit. It's there because of Lake Michigan, but these are springs in the estuary. They're there because of groundwater. Groundwater flows through aquifers, and our, the geology I've been talking about uh, forms these aquifers. And so in the northern part of the state, um, we have these Precambrian rocks that are things like uh, granites and rhyolites and quartzites, and you can see some of those rocks if you go to the dells of the Eau Claire River. Uh, those, are, those are rhyolites there. The sandstone aquifer that I mentioned, the sandstones that, form, that occur in southern Wisconsin are, form a great sandstone aquifer, and you can see those sandstones if you go to the dells and go on the boat trip. And those are some of the sandstones, Cambrian sandstones you can see there. And then we have the dolomite aquifer that you could, you could see in outcrops over on in eastern Wisconsin. All these are really good aquifers that supply, supply uh, cities, villages, industries. I like to show people this slide to give you a sense of, of relative depths. So this, this is to give you a sense of where these aquifers are beneath our feet. So this, this, this is a view of Milwaukee taken from the lake. Uh, if you're out on a boat in Lake Michigan, with the geology pretty much to scale. This is to scale. So the tallest buildings in Milwaukee are about 600 feet high. And the, sh the typical domestic well in Wisconsin, like a well I have in my house south of Madison here, is between 100 and 300 feet deep, or about half as deep as the tallest building in Milwaukee. Many of the municipal wells, like the well we have here in Madison, that where we get the municipal water, supply are between 200 and 800 or perhaps 1,000 feet deep, and they're reaching down to this sandstone aquifer where it occurs. However, the deepest wells in the state, which are mostly over in eastern Wisconsin near Milwaukee and Waukesha, get down to over 2,000 feet deep. Think of that compared to the tallest building in Milwaukee next time you're there. Uh, you, we're looking at something that's three, three or possibly four times as deep as that building is tall. And some of these wells are 100 years old, so imagine the effort that went into drilling them 100 years ago uh, and the, and, and the, the public uh, infrastructure value that they have now. I think it's just an, an interesting thing to con consider that these are hidden infrastructures that, that are really important to us. 
I mentioned I've been talking about bedrock aquifers, but we also have, because of the glaciers, we have this sand and gravel aquifer over parts of the state, much of the state, that's, that's uh, composes a shallow aquifer, and much of it is along river valleys. Up north, I, I've shown all this as sand and gravel, but it, it, some of it is, yields better water or more water than, than other places. Here's an example of how that sand and gravel looks near West Bend. But that sand and gravel, which was formed, uh, for example, in Glacial Lake Oshkosh, forms a great shallow aquifer that, that's uh, in the central sand plains that supports the potato and vegetable industry and supports a lot of irrigation. It's, a, it's a, again an area of some controversy right now, but that's, that's where that aquifer came from. That's a shallow, shallow aquifer of sand and gravel. Groundwater discharge has, has been a really culturally important thing in Wisconsin. And, and historically, we had a lot of artesian or flowing wells that flow under natural artesian pressure. This was one in Door County that I took a photo of a number of years ago. These were often the places, reasons people located homes or houses or, or villages in certain places. Um, this is an interesting picture of a flowing well in De Pere in 1890. And you can see the water here is flowing up at this level, it's you know, slowing like 30 feet in the air in downtown De Pere. You can see the guy in his raincoat standing below and all the people were excited. This is like one of those oil well gushers you see in Texas. Uh, but the, the artesian head or the artesian pressure historically was way above the land surface in eastern Wisconsin. Since we've developed and started drilling wells and pumping water, that artesian head has, has diminished and the wells don't flow there anymore. But historically, that was a pretty big deal. Imagine just drilling, drilling a well and then the water just flows under its own pressure. You don't even need a pump. Uh, and that leads me to talk a little bit about springs. We have over 10,000 mapped springs in Wisconsin. And we're studying them now. We're trying to map them more. I'll talk about that, that in a minute. Um, they have historically been really important as, as for settlement, for, for locating uh, villages and industries, and also as, as an industry of bottled water. So here's bottled water being consumed at the Bethesda Spring in Waukesha County. Waukesha, in fact, was called the Spring City. It, that's its nickname because it, was, it had so many springs. It was known as the Saratoga of the Midwest after Saratoga <coughs> Springs, New York, which is famous for its springs. People traveled all, all over the Midwest to come to Waukesha to drink the water or bathe in the water. Unfortunately, a lot of those springs are no longer there. They've been, they've been destroyed or drained or built over, uh, which, is, which is unfortunate. But we have a, we have a rich history there. Um, our relationships with Illinois have not always, been, has not always been great. Prior to the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, there was a scheme to pipe water from Waukesha down to Chicago. <laughs> To, uh, to serve the World's Fair. And there was, a, there was almost a riot uh, because it was opposed by, by people in Waukesha County. And in fact, here's a, art, a, a political cartoon um, showing the, the uh, Chicago, it says, Waukesha frightening away the Chicago hog. And, it, and, and Chicago was represented as a hog trying to drink out of the Waukesha Spring. And I guess these are all local politicians trying to shoot it or, or beat it up or hold it back. And, uh, and things, things never changed because during that time, there was actually a protest train that came to Madison. You can see that it says, no pipeline. And so this, the, the, if you can't read it, the caption of this, this was in 1893, the caption says, special Waukesha train to Madison to fight granting a franchise to pipe the high GF spring water to Chicago. So things, political protest in Madison is nothing new, apparently. Nor are schemes to pipe things different places. Um, here's an interesting art, uh, uh, photo that, that I really like. This, this is a, a big, what we call the Big Spring at Donald Park, right here in Dane County, over by the town of Mount Vernon. Historical photo where the town turned out with a brass band, everybody in their Sunday best, I think there's even a choir over here, to assemble around the spring for a town picture. Um, and that, you can still go there now. There's no brass band today, but it's a wonderful place to visit. There's a little park there called Donald Park. And the, a nice hiking trail is a great place to visit. It's one of the biggest springs in Dane County. And we are doing a statewide spring survey now, and I thought I showed, kind of wind up with this little video it's just showing you uh, some nice artesian flow in a spring. Uh, this happens to be in Cadiz <coughs> Springs in, in Greene County. The person that took this picture is named Grace Graham. She's one of our employees at the survey. 
And this leads me to talk about what our survey does. We, one of the things we're doing right now is a, is a, sur is a, a, a survey of all the springs in the state because that hasn't been done for, for almost 50 or 60 years. Um, so, so what are the other things we do at the survey? Well, we do lots of things. I know you can't read all this, but we, we work on geologic studies. Last year we had projects in all 72 counties, which is pretty good for a staff of about 25. Uh, we collected over 2,000 feet of rock core with our drill rig. We looked at over 153 groundwater monitoring wells. We maintain a core repository of, it's got over, over 600,000 feet of rock core out at, out at a facility we have in Mount Horeb. Um, we have thin sections of rock. We have water well cuttings. We do many projects like we're working on the St. Croix waterway. We're working in the Driftless area. We're working on many Wisconsin counties. Um, we have uh, all these pages of field notes, uh, thin sections. We don't, people download publications. We had over 24,000 publications downloaded from our website last year. We had over 14,000 educational contacts. Uh, we're on Facebook and Twitter, thanks to Carol McCartney over there. We do groundwater models. We, we study different parts of the state. We study water quality. We study geologic history. It's an exciting place to work, and I, I'm, I'm so proud of our, of our staff. If you want to know about, more about us, take a look at our website. Uh, here's the address. Uh, one of the things you can do if you go there is you can, you can search for publications about Wisconsin. And there's a you can search by area of the state, you can search by um, topic, you can search by author or type of publication. And so there's a lot of information there uh, that, that changes all the time. So to wind up my talk, uh, geology has had profound influences on our, our culture, our past, present, and our future. Wisconsin's a great place to study geology and, and it's a great place to be a geologist. So I would like to urge all of you to take advantage of the opportunities we have here to appreciate our, our geo heritage and, and, and get out and, and look at some of this some of these features. So thank you very much. And I'd ha be happy to take questions if there's some questions. Yes ma'am. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> and so what is the uh, geologic benefit? Well, the, what, what's, ha what's happened now is, is, is Waukesha developed. They, you know, it, it grew from a, a small town to a, a pretty big city and kind of merged, you know, urban area kind of merged with Milwaukee. Um, and they, but historically, Waukesha and the area around it have gotten their, their groundwater from deep wells in that sandstone aquifer. And the, as, as they expanded, that aquifer wasn't supplying quite enough water, and also there was a problem with naturally occurring radium in the water. So the water was not uh, necessarily good to drink without a lot of treatment. Um, the other interesting thing about Waukesha is it's, it's just outside the Lake Michigan surface water basin. And so by federal law, they are not allowed to take water out of the Great Lakes, an international compact, but Waukesha, being that it's there, does need does need water, and so there were, there's been a number of uh, efforts to try to, to to provide them with water. And the latest one is that they would pipe water from Lake Michigan, treat it, and then put it back into the basin, and that's that's. Uh, it's been approved at some level. I'm not sure quite where that is right now. It, it, it's been approved by the Great Lakes uh, Basin Commission. I'm not quite sure. I, I think there's going to be some challenges to that. Uh, by the way, it's not the amount of water they want is is not a, you know, it's it's a lot of water. But in terms of the Great Lakes, it's a you know literally a drop in the bucket. The controversial thing, really, in my opinion, about that is it, it it's it's a precedent setter for other other people and agencies that might want to move water around the country. Other questions? Tom, can you show that video again of the um, yeah. schools coming down? Yeah, I can and probably. My question is going to be. Might be take me a minute to get back there. Uh, I was surprised that the ice slopes weren't here in Madison. Well, 12, 13,000 yeah, years ago. Yeah. This is the first I've heard of this. Um, 
think I've been at the Arboretum where they talk about it as the uh, you know, big cliff device for right here. And well, there was. 15,000 years ago, and then they received it, but that isn't at all what's shown here. And the second question is, um, it looked like glacial Lake Wisconsin forms twice and therefore would have drained twice. How many days did it take to drain? Well, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, according to Lee Clayton, who's deceased now, John Attic, it, it was the, the second time. It took three or four days, perhaps, to carve the delts. Uh, that's what they think. Uh, but you imagine that you know some, a lake 100 miles or you know 80 miles long, that's a lot of water. And as soon as that ice dam melted, apparently that broke. That's what happened. It all went surging down the, the Wisconsin River. And there have been other catastrophic drainages like that that, that, that that we know about that have happened around the, around the country. This is not the only place that something like that has happened. Um, so yeah, let me let me see if I can get this going again. It's interesting. Yeah, to, I can kind of put your put a dot on where about where Madison is, and it's it is interesting that that uh, the uh, you know the ice wasn't here all the time. It came and went. Uh, so there we are, twenty four thousand. It was here, and then it retreated. There's Glacial Lake, Wisconsin. Uh, there's the some of the Madison lakes just at the edge of there. Uh, Probably that was probably Glacial Lake Middleton, and here's Glacial Lake Oshkosh. Then it's gone. Then it's back. Uh, so it was a very episodic thing, and I think that's that's the message that, that they're trying to to give with this uh, with this video. Well, and these these are actually a series of maps too. So you don't if you, you can download this from our website, by the way, both as a video but also as a series of I think 50 is it 50 maps. 40 ish. 40 is some maps, so you could look at that one map at a time, and there's some text and explanation that goes with it. Probably answers your question. I have to change the mental image I have in my head that if I were to go out here 14,000 years ago, there would have been a, <coughs> a glacier, and that is not. Probably not 14,000. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, by giving away <coughs> our fracking sand, are we weakening our own geography? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. Are we, by, by, by selling or, you know, we're not giving it away, we're selling it or somebody's selling it. Are we weakening our own geography? We're certainly changing our landscape. Um, and, uh, you know, for, for, for the people that are near the mines, uh, it can be a big change where there's a, you know, they take an entire hill or entire bluff and it's, it's pretty well flat. When they're when they're done, when they reclaim the area, so that's a, that's a, a big change. Uh, I don't I don't think it's weakening the landscape. It's certainly changing the landscape, and it's changing you know for for, for people that have grown up with one landscape all their lives, and suddenly it's, it's within a few years it's it's different. That is that can be a, a, a hard and difficult thing for them. Um, but that's the nature of, of, of uh, resource exploitation, you know, there's, there's always some change involved. So um, is it good or bad? I, it, it, it's hard to put a value on that. It's, it's certainly different. And, and that's one of the things that our survey is, is studying. We have people that are looking at some of what are the impacts with regard to water quality, uh, soils, and, and that sort of thing when this, when this sand is taken away and, and the, the landscape is reclaimed, because there will be some changes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Thinking of that sand like overburden and coal mine, why didn't the state of Wisconsin say to the people in North Dakota or Wyoming where the sand goes, fine, you can have it, but when you're finished with it, you have to bring it back? Well, they could have, yes. <laughs> the sand is just an abrasive to do some work, and when the oil is out, that sand would be there. Why didn't we make them bring it back? Well, that would be, that's an interesting question. I think it would be pretty hard to. <laughs> to bring it back because it's pumped. It's pumped like a couple miles underground. Right. Um, so. And it stays down there. It doesn't come. No, it's, it's it stays there. What oh, the, so the reason they use it is they uh, the whole, whole way fracking works is they they they, they pump it down and, and uh, literally these 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 wells are they don't go straight down. They they go down and then they bend. So they go up laterally and they go literally miles. Uh, it's it's incredible technology. But the sand is. It's pumped down under such pressure that it, it cracks the rock, and then the idea is that the rock 
uh, can't come back together because the sand grains go into the cracks and hold them open. That's why the sand has to be so hard. That's why Wisconsin sand is so good for this. Uh, and then the, because the cracks are held open, more oil can come into the well. So it would, it would be pretty hard to get it back. It would be so expensive that they wouldn't be able to frack. Which yeah, 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 they, they, yeah, they, they wouldn't be able to frack that. probably. That's right. Yes, sir? Whenever I hear two geologists talk, or three or four, I always ask, because I'm such a novice, I say do they really know what they're talking about. Are they just, are these theories or are these facts? So when we talk about the Van Heist Rock or something, are we talking about theory or are we talking about something that by and large is universally accepted among geologists? Uh, I think the Van Heist Rock, I would say, is universally accepted. Um, I mean, there's, uh, the, 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 the facts of the structural geology are, are um, they're, they're pretty cut and, cut and dry. You know, we, and, and there's been literally thousands of geologists that have looked at that. And as, as, as time goes on and we, we have new, uh, new scientific techniques like, like different dating techniques uh, to measure how old rocks are and so forth and to measure what's called the provenance or where the rocks came from, um, and they started adding new techniques uh, almost universally uh, with a few, you know, maybe a few minor details, but generally these, the new work supports the old, the old work. For example, these days people on my staff do something called detrital zircon analysis. Zircons are tiny little very resistant minerals that, that are probably the last thing to dissolve or erode when a, when a rock, an ancient rock is eroded away. You know, when I was in college, nobody ever did anything with these, but now, now they can separate these, they can look at them, and they can actually tell where the rock, the original sandstone came from. And that all kind of makes sense with, with theory. So, you know, there, there are certainly parts of geology where the, that are theoretical, but this, these basic structural relationships that we see in Wisconsin are, are, are very widely accepted and acknowledged. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, well, there was, uh, th there were many glacial lakes in Wisconsin where it, as this ice came and went, there were lakes that occurred, uh, and, you know, were there and, and left. Glacial Lake Middleton was, was dammed up ahead of the glacier when the ice was sitting around Madison. You can see the bed of it now. If you go out west of Middleton, they're around where, uh, I think it's called Maury Air Airport, Maury Field, a very flat area. That's the bed of Glacial Lake Middleton. Uh, and that's why it's so flat. And so it, it, and it, it went out a couple of miles there, and it, I can't remember exactly what the time was when it existed, but it, it was there. Carol, maybe you remember what time of Glacial Lake Middleton? Um, I think that was probably the time that, that we were talking about when the ice was here in Madison. Yeah. And then it backed up a little bit, and then we had Glacial Lake Yahara, yeah. which was the expanse of the four lakes were all one lake and much, and much bigger. Yep. And, uh, and so when they widened University Avenue, um, if, you were, if you would drive down there while the construction was going on, you could see shoreline kind of sands uh, in, in the construction. That, you know, it, looked, it looked like you were on a beach, but you were way up above the water. But that's because that's where the <coughs> Glacier Lake Yahara was about. Um, I'm thinking it was nine feet higher than where it, it, its highest level is now on the Dota. Carol is a Pleistocene geologist, so I can ask her. <laughs> <laughs> I remember so much of it. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Um, I recently came across references on outcrops, a place called Miller's Bend, which I cannot locate. Miller's Bend. You ever heard of that, Carol? No. Uh, it doesn't ring a bell at all. It's a frequently noted. Well, we can look it up in the geology, in the roadside geology of Wisconsin. Uh, I, I don't remember that offhand. Sometimes they have different, you know, it might be known by a different name, too. Uh, and, and we have, uh, on our website, we have uh, a list of outcrops. So it could be one of those. And, and so you can search through there. I'm trying to think how you find the outcrops. Like, so if you go to our website, there is a search bar on the, on the right hand. Might just put Miller's Bend in there and see if it comes up too. So if we have an outcrop description of Miller's Bend, we should be able to find 
okay to find it that way. And if you can't, then you can find my picture under the people and call me or send me an email and I will keep looking for you. <laughs> if you look under people and you scroll down, you'll see my face. You don't have to remember my name. But it is <laughs> Ma'am, you have a question. Can you explain to me why there's such an abundance of springs in the southwest of Wisconsin? And I look up into the northern part of the state, and I'm, I'm very familiar with that area, and it seems like there's water, water everywhere. Um, why are there not so many springs well, up there? I, actually, I can't explain that. The, the, uh, it, it has to do with the the, the driftless area was not glaciated, and so that landscape in the driftless area is, is much older, and it, it's much more rugged and eroded. So if you do go just west of Madison, you're past the glacial boundary, and you get into a, a landscape with a lot more hills and valleys and the coolies, and springs occur at, at low spots in the landscape. So there are a lot more low spots out there. I mean, there are high spots. You know, there's a lot more to topographic difference between the hills and the valleys. And, this, and, and, also, and then we have the right, so we have the right topography, but we also have the right geology. We have this sandstone that tends to be pretty, per, pretty permeable. And, 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 then, and it has some layers in there that, that tend to, to resist the water at certain spots and make it pop out of the hills. So <laughs> that, that's an area where we, we have a lot of springs. And if you go over to the Mississippi River or along the Wisconsin River, there are many, many springs, more than people really see sometimes. Um, if, you know, it's interesting, one, I, I had a slide, I, I, Carol told me to cut it down, so I didn't put a lot of things in, but well, if, you, Carol. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you ever go to Villa, Villa, Villa Louis, which is the big old estate over at Prairie du Chien, mm -hmm. uh, there are fountains there that are, are flowing artesian wells, because the, the water for that, and, and that's right next to the Mississippi River, uh, and that, that the water for that estate was all groundwater that was coming out of flowing artesian wells, and those wells are still there, and if you go to the spring by the main house, the, or the, or the fountain, that's a flowing, a flowing well. Um, up north, we have, certainly, we have a lot of water. If you go to Biles uh, County or something, not very many springs, because you don't have a, you know, it's a fairly level <coughs> topography. You don't have the, you know, you have some hills, but don't have the big hills and the big valleys, which is really what you need for, for a lot of springs. Yes? Hey, uh, excellent talk. Uh, just as kind of a follow-up to what you're doing now, kind of documenting the springs of Wisconsin, um, is your workflow primarily kind of looking for what was previously known, or are you um, expecting to find new springs in <coughs> unknown locations? And you know, if that is the case, like how do you find these springs that are more plentiful than we know? Yeah, that's a great question. So she's asking how our spring survey works. Well, the the folks that are working on the spring survey are they started with the the old the historical spring maps. Those were done back in the 1950s, and, and of course back then we didn't have a lot of technology. There, you know, there was no GPS, and the, no few aerial photographs, and not great maps sometimes. So, uh, and so some of those springs were mislocated or, or put in the wrong spot. Um, but what they're doing now is 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 focusing on the bigger springs, and the, and the, the, the motivation for that project is that the it has to do with high capacity wells and the, and the DNR's need to understand uh, they don't want to harm harm springs by putting in new wells, so they want to use information about springs as part of their well approval process. So they're focusing on the springs that are they're about a quarter of a cubic foot per second in discharge. So the, our springs team has been going through the historical records and, and trying to find those larger springs and then trying to go to the land and, and actually find the springs. Um, I'm not sure whether they've found any new springs, but they are, but they probably found a few when they, because they're talking to landowners and, and um, springs are pretty predictable when you, you know, if there's one spring in an area, there's likely to be others because they're, you know, they're not going to occur on top of the hill, they're going to occur in a valley. <coughs> we can tell where they're going to be. Um, and they, they certainly can't visit all 10,000, so, so they're, they're They'll be visiting a several hundred and documenting those very well, measuring the flow and looking at the biology and so forth. Ah. Over the last 10, 20, 100 years, how has the water law changed as to who controls surface water and groundwater and the waters of the United States? If you're a hydrogeologist, um, 
this is one of the most controversial things we have. Mm -hmm. um, water, we now understand, flows underground. It's not like mining something that's static under your land. What is the current status, both at the federal level from the Waters of the United States doctrine and the... Well, well water is, it, it, it does, um, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, Carol, but the water is, this groundwater use is, First of all, groundwater and surface water are often treated differently. <coughs> groundwater uh, law is, is often state, has to do with state law. And then historically in, in the United States, the western states have had a different sort of water law than the eastern states. Uh, the western states, west of the, west of the Mississippi, the groundwater rights are separated from property ownership. And so you can own property and not have the water rights or own water rights and not own the property. Uh, and that has to do with irrigation in the West. In the Eastern states, uh, with rep the riparian doctrine, where if you own the land, you own the water, uh, and and the water went with the property. Of course, both of these doctrines are a little bit uh, screwy because the groundwater doesn't care who's <laughs> you know who's, who owns it. It's going to go where it's going to go. Um, but there was some fascinating. Uh, uh, fascinating law, water law in Wisconsin, of having to do with artesian wells and, and in the past uh, uh, whether a person could just um, open up a well and let it flow even though that was reducing the pressure for everybody else's well nearby. And there were a couple of famous cases in the name of which I don't remember now that, that related to, to that. Now, the, I think of What's of most interest right now is, is, is what's happened in Wisconsin in just in the last few years, where having to do with high capacity wells, and you'll, you'll see more about this in the legislature probably this year. Um, the idea of whether what, what <coughs> rights or responsibilities the DNR has to regulate water groundwater use from high capacity wells. Uh, historically, um, you know when. when and a high capacity well, by the way, is any well that produces more than 70 gallons a minute or about 100,000 gallons a day. Uh, so most irrigation wells, most municipal wells, most industrial wells are high capacity wells. Homeowner wells for a private home are not. They're hardly ever would be. So historically, the DNR um, would, would approve these wells, and there were, there were very there were very few restrictions on what they could approve. It couldn't be it you know, couldn't harm another high capacity well. It couldn't harm a trout stream. There were just a few regulations like that. Um, about four years ago, there was a case called the Lake Beulah case that it, it was Lake Beulah, which is in Waukesha County, where there was a lawsuit filed uh, by people who, lake owners who, who um, uh, were protesting a new municipal well that was going in near their lake, and they were worried that the lake, this well was going to harm their lake. The DNR granted the uh, permit for the well anyway. There was a big lawsuit that went to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that, Wisconsin, that the DNR not only had a right, but a responsibility to consider impacts to other things like surface water resources when they were uh, improving these wells. That has been the doctrine, and then, and then following that, there was another case that had to do with what are called cumulative impacts. That is, the w impact of one single well might not be very great, but if you have two or five or 10 or 100 wells nearby, you're starting to add up to something important. And, and so there was another court case called the Bolt decision that uh, stated that the DNR had the authority or the responsibility to consider <coughs> cumulative impacts. And so when somebody applied for a permit for a new irrigation well, they had to not only look at that well, but they had to look at all the wells around it and see if that well was going to be the straw that broke the camel's back. <coughs> uh, just this summer, the, our Attorney General gave an opinion that the DNR did not have this authority. Uh, and so since that opinion, which happened on June 10th of this year, the DNR has gone back to what they were doing five or six years ago, which was not considering cumulative impacts and not considering impacts on surface water, except under special cases like being near a trout stream or, or, or near some other special situation. So an attorney general's opinion trumps a ruling of a court? Uh, well, 
Uh, Sing it with me, please. These are the, these are the times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, I'm just curious because that's a whole new yeah. way of looking at civics. Well, I expect I, went to, I expect we haven't heard the last of this time. So, <laughs> so I, I, I would predict the future. That's good. When the, when, the, when the legislature gets back in session, I expect there'll be some some uh, bills related to high capacity wells because there there are people, as you might expect, that are unhappy about this. And what has the, been the response of the state Supreme Court to the Attorney General um, opinion? I'm not aware they've had a response. I don't, I don't think it's come up yet. Do they have to wait for somebody withstanding? I think they have to wait for somebody to, to sue somebody else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think so. Yes, sir. <coughs> you mentioned anywhere about 500 million years old. Uh, tears, so be, uh, no information. Yes. Uh, is that true with other states, uh, geologists who find a similar trend? Yes. Or is there something that we can capture from their way of looking at it and look at it in this concept? Well, that's that's a great question. So his question has to do with, you know, I, I said that we're missing some record of time, and how do we know what happened? Well, that's what geologists around the world do. I mean, we, it is true that if you go to other places, those rocks are there. And so what geologists do is correlate these rocks around, a, 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 you know, around the country and around the world to put the whole geologic record together so that we know what we're missing. So if you, for example, if you go over to Michigan, the rocks that are missing here are present in Michigan, as well as some of the rocks we have here. And we look at the layer cake of rocks over there and the layer cake we have here, and we say, well, this is missing here. And we kind of put a, it's like putting a big puzzle together. And so, and, and, and that's what that's what geologists work on is trying to build the world's uh, the, the world's record of, of geologic history, looking at incomplete records at, from place to place, but putting them all together. So that that's that's how we work. Yes, sir. We had a talk about uh, the Wisconsin River flowing east. Mm -hmm. That was really interesting. Yeah, that was that was by Eric Carson, who's one of our staff members. Are there any other things like that that are in the pipeline? Well, we have uh, sure we have we. I mean that that's a that's a particularly uh, compelling story on the Wisconsin River flowing east. So I'm not sure we have anything quite that exciting right now. But you never know. Uh, we have one of our geologists that's making a new map of the Precambrian surface in Dodge Dodge in Columbia County. Um, why do we care about that? Because that and the Precambrian surface is buried. We didn't, we can't see it, but that's the represents the bottom of our aquifer, and, and so depending on where that is, it, it, it has implications for how much water we can get in that part of the state. Another one of our geologists, Jay Zambito, who I think might have spoken at this at, at Wednesday night at the lab, is looking at, at water quality, groundwater quality, related to the history of the sandstone deposition in western Wisconsin and mineralization that happened there. Um, so, you know, and maybe none of those are going to catch the imagination like the Wisconsin River, but you never know. Uh, so, but that's when we, when we do this work. Um, one, of, one, of the, one of the neat things about working at the survey is our, our staff work on practical problems, but they're all creative, intelligent people who, who, who are curious, and they, they sometimes discover things that they, they didn't think they would find. So, you know, there's, you never know. We, we, we may come back with something fantastic in a couple of years. You never know. Question. I'm, I'm curious as to where in Wisconsin there are karsts and how karst. the, um, large capacity wells impact that. Okay, so our question was about karst. And so karst is a <coughs> karst occurs in these in these dolomite or carbonate rock landscapes where where uh, uh, groundwater has dissolved away the rock and that leads to uh, crevices and cracks and even in extreme cases, sinkholes. Uh, Wisconsin does have some karst features. Uh, Door County is a place that you can see them. Uh, um, uh, and some of the other, you know, there's, there's some karst in, in Brown County and uh, Mantuac, uh, Kiwani County has areas of some karst features. There's even some karst here in Dane County. You can go over, over west, of, west of Madison, uh, in Middleton, there's something called Richardson's Cave. That's a karst feature. Uh, we have Cave of the Mounds. That's a karst feature. There's, if you go out to Blue Mound State Park, there's some sinkholes 
there. And then if you go to the southwestern Wisconsin, you know, around Platteville, there are, there are certainly some karst features there. We don't have a real well-developed karst like you might find in southern Indiana or in Kentucky. We don't have enormous caves and enormous sinkholes. Our, our karst is sort of immature, uh, small, small features, but it's important because it needs to, uh, in karst landscapes, there's very little uh, soil sometimes to filter groundwater. And so if you have a spill of something on the surface, uh, you can move that water, contaminated water, right down to the aquifer very quickly. So that's why we care about knowing what these things are. 